Well, good afternoon. I'm Steve Saranovic in the Economics Department and a member of IIEP. Um, we're going to switch into switch gears here and do a couple of policy sessions to finish out the day. So the first policy session is going to be about um, outlook on uh, U.S.-China trade policy, and the second policy session afterwards will be on economic development in China. And um, so I think what we'll do is we'll do uh, 15 to 20 minutes for each of you. Okay, and then we'll have them come up at the front and take questions from the group um, afterwards, okay? So we'll, we'll, instead of doing it one-on-one, -on -one, we'll do it that way. Okay, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce, I'll introduce the three um, speakers very quickly, and then uh, we'll get started. Uh, so we've got Wendy Cutler here from the, um, who's Vice President of the Asia Society Policy Institute and has formerly been uh, for a long time um, at the USTR. Uh, we've got Junjia Hong, who's a professor and dean of the School of International Trade and Economics at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. And we've got our own Maggie Chen, um, who's the director of IIEP and has been before you several times already today. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce uh, Wendy Cutler to come on up and uh, make a few remarks. Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here today on a Friday afternoon. It's a pretty good turnout. Um, I will say I was a GW graduate, but I'm not going to tell you what year. <laughs> um, I thought what I would do today, first of all, I'm not going to speak for many more. I'm going to speak for 10 to 15 minutes, and I hope we can have you know more Q's and A's. Um, um, and what I thought I would do today is just give you my sense of the outlook for the U.S.-China trade relationship. Um, and you'll see that I'm going to express a lot of concern, and I think going forward, I think we all get, we need to get ready for some tension in the relationship. Um, but I'm also hopeful that the leaders from both countries can find a way to manage this tension or at least reduce its magnitude. Um, throughout my career at the office of the U.S. Trade Representative, and I was there for close to 30 years, um, I had the opportunity to work with chi my Chinese counterparts both on bilateral trade negotiations. I've worked with, with them in a regional context, um, mainly in the APEC forum, and also in the WTO as we negotiated um, deals like the Information Technology Agreement, um, and I've worked with them on WTO compliance issues. While I did not work on um, China WTO accession negotiations, I was at USTR at that time. And it was a really exciting time, I have to say. Um, there was a, clearly a sense of optimism about the outlook for our trade relationship. This was about now 15, 15 and a half years ago. Through its accession to the WTO, China agreed to change thousands of laws and regulations they agreed to undertake a whole host of market opening reforms, and they agreed to slash their tariffs, lift services restrictions, and play by the WTO rules. And at that point in time, the reform path seemed unstoppable, and future WTO negotiating rounds were envisioned to provide an opportunity to lock in more Chinese opening, as well as from other countries, into the WTO with respect to not only the rules in the WTO, but also the bilateral market access schedules. But over time, and particularly in recent years, it has become apparent that, it's, that this reform trajectory did not transpire as expected, and the failure of the WTO Doha development negotiations have led countries to look elsewhere um, in terms of market opening, particularly with respect to bilateral negotiations and regional deals. So where does this leave us? Clearly, the US-China trade relationship is so important, and it's only going to get more important as trade flows between the two countries continue to grow. I mean, I'm, when I first started at USTR, we had one person working on US-China trade relations. And if you go to USTR now, there's a whole office, including three or four people in our office in Beijing from USTR, um, which is only the second place where we've ever had people stationed overseas. And I think that's a testament to how this trading relationship has grown. 
That said, um, the bilateral trade re relationship right now, I don't think, is in a good place. And I fear that all the signs that at least I'm seeing suggest that it's just going to get tougher as we look ahead. Now, why do I say this? And I want to offer you just a few observations here. I wasn't there yesterday, but I think it was captured based on my um, reading of the reports. But yesterday, USTR held it, um, a hearing for their annual WTO compliance um, exercise when they issue a report. And they invite stakeholders and other people from around town to come in and to talk about their concerns, what's working, what's not working. And it seemed like witness after witness testified on growing concern on the magnitude, scope, and nature of the barriers faced in the, in the Chinese market, and the realization that the WTO rules are just not suited to address them. Now, what are these barriers? And this is, not a, 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 this is just an illustrative list, but they include investment restrictions, forced technology transfers, overcapacity in key manufacturing sectors, other intellectual property issues, industrial policies, competing with subsidized state-owned enterprises, just to name you know, a few of the, of the top priorities. And what, one of the reasons I'm emphasizing this is that a lot of the same business people who were speaking yesterday, only about five, 10 years ago, were giving a very, they had a very different tone in their presentations. Um, I think what we're seeing is many of the traditional U.S. stakeholders who supported the U.S.-China trade relationship are becoming increasingly concerned about the barriers that they're facing in the Chinese market, um, and they are urging the administration to address these barriers. Second, um, the administration um, is focused on reducing bilateral trade deficits. That seems to be one of their key priorities with respect to China and with respect to other countries, including Mexico. They're currently um, in, involved in the NAFTA negotiations. And just the, core, the, the um, meeting they had yesterday with, um, um, with the Koreans, um, they're very concerned about the US-Korea growing bilateral trade deficit, and they're looking to correct that through amendments. At $350 billion um, trade deficit with the US, China accounts for about 75% of the value of the next 15 countries on the US bilateral trade deficit list. Third, I think the administration lacks a coherent China trade policy. Now, in all fairness, the administration is still relatively new, and reports are that they're trying to develop um, a China trade policy. Um, we're seeing you know, a lot of conflicting signals. There are a lot of hardline comments made on the campaign trail and pledges to label China as a currency manipulator on day one. Um, also to impose 35% tariffs on Chinese imports into the U.S. Um, early in the administration. But these pledges haven't materialized. Um, we saw at the Mar-a-Lago Mar summit a good meeting between the two presidents and the launch of the Comprehensive Economic Dialogue, which was followed by a 100-day plan and announcement of immediate deliverables. But this was followed by a breakdown in those talks in July. Um, at the same time, we've seen USTR launch um, a Section 301 investigation into Chinese IPR practices, particularly the forced technology um, transfer issue. And the administration has also um, initiated other, act other investigations under their trade laws um, aimed at China, including on steel, aluminum, and um, solar. Without such a coherent policy, prospects for disarray and more tension increase, in my view, as sometimes if the left hand in the administration doesn't know what the right hand's doing, it's just confusing. And it's also confusing for China to kind of sort this all out and to try and figure out what it needs to do to address US concerns. I also think the tension may increase because the economic reform process in China has clearly slowed down, if not, um, if not has stalled, with the, ex, uh, the exception of a few um, you know, areas such as services and innovation. And I mention this because what I learned as a trade negotiator, when a country was undergoing reform, and particularly market opening reform, there were a lot of opportunities to negotiate market opening deals with them. 
a lot of times countries would want to use the trade deals, whether it be the WTO or bilateral or regional trade deal, to cement these reforms and to be able to tell their domestic um, citizens that they were undertaking these um, reforms um, in the context of um, international negotiations. And we saw this when China joined the WTO, um, and the WTO accession really provided a cover for China, I would argue, to undertake a great deal of reform. Um, while I'm on the subject of economic reform, I just want to put a plug in for an event we'll be holding next week um, in Washington. We'll be launching um, what we call a Ch the China Economic Reform Dashboard. We're doing this in conjunction with Dan um, Rosen of the Rhodium Group. And what we're, what we're doing is we're going to track reforms by China in 10 key areas in an, in in an interactive um, web tool. Um, and um, I hope you all can join us. I can give you more information. But um, either if you can join us at, at the launch event next Wednesday and or access our website next week to, um, to access these materials. And this track record, this, this reform tool, will be updated on a quarterly basis so we can keep track of whether China is indeed proceeding with reforms. OK, and then back to my kind of the fifth reason I'm, I'm concerned about where we are going in US-China trade relations is that um, we're seeing a lot of proactive Chinese policies, such as the China 2025 um, plan, the semiconductor industry subsidization, um, and other areas where all seem to suggest that China is looking to build national champion companies in China and that US companies over time are going to have a hard time competing against these companies um, going forward, and not just in China, but I, I, I believe globally as well. So based on the above, I think that we are headed toward tough times with China on the trade front. And while this may be viewed as a bilateral problem, a problem between US and China, um, I've learned quickly in my new job in the Asia Society that a lot of our Asian trading partners are very concerned about where we're going bilaterally. And they feel that whatever happens bilaterally, particularly if we're leading, to it in, we're leading towards a time with more trade tension, that they will be kind of cr caught in the crosshairs of, of that tension. Um, I can, so I can, you know, basically my, I feel that there will be increased trade tension between the US and China. But the magnitude and scope of such, such tension is still an uncertainty. Um, I think there continues to be a fear of a trade war, um, where, but China has made it clear that if there was a trade war, that the US has a lot more to lose than China. I believe that there are things that both governments can and should do to lessen these tensions and manage these tensions. And in this regard, I see the upcoming visit of our president to um, China um, next month as, a, as an important opportunity and action forcing event to make progress and chart a path forward on our trade agenda. Um, these type of visits have always served as what we call action forcing events. We're already seeing a lot of communication and visits between senior administration officials and there are a lot of working level contacts, contacts trying to sort out what we call deliverables, things that can be announced during that meeting. Um, in, in addition, um, I would just bring your attention that we've seen a series of announcements by China in the past month in the lead up to the visit, um, which suggests that China is trying to take measures to address some of the US concerns, albeit on a limited scope. So for example, just a few weeks on, on the um, steel over capacity issue, China announced it has successfully cut capacity of steel by 100 million tons. On intellectual property, it announced um, a four-month campaign to protect IPR of foreign businesses. And here I emphasize of foreign businesses because I think this is one of the first times where they have announced a campaign that was just going to be focused on the foreign element. Um, third, they recently announced on the investment front the removal of, long, of a long stand, some longstanding regulation which um, required companies to set up a representative office in China before investing. And fourth, they recently announced some movement on financial services reform um, that they are drafting proposals to 
um, greater, give foreign investors and insurance companies greater access. Um, these are definitely welcome steps, but many would say long overdue and insufficient. And also, just I would say the other thing that may happen during the summit is that there'll be announcements of new purchases of, um, of US products, agriculture, Boeing jets, et cetera, um, or maybe some discrete agreements um, on low-hanging fruit issues. But I think this time around, people are going to be looking for more to come out of the summit on trade. And I think what people will be looking for is a commitment by both countries to tackle the tough issues I mentioned earlier, like overcapacity, like technology transfer, like industrial policy, and do this on a quick but realistic time frame, and to use the, the, um, the comprehensive economic dialogue to focus on these issues with milestones for action with one building on another. With respect to the United States, this administration is very focused on what they call their enforcement agenda, and that is using US trade laws um, to defend US rights um, under our trade agreements. And I suspect the administration is going to continue to do this under statutes that haven't been used in many years. And I would hope and I would argue that the administration should make sure that any measures they take under these trade statutes should be done in a WTO consistent manner. I think that raising US tariffs against Chinese imports, which is a clear violation of US WTO commitments under the WTO, will be met immediately with counter retaliation by China, which could easily spiral into the trade war. And I think the United States, instead of acting unilaterally on a lot of on these issues, should really try and work with other countries that share similar concerns. So whether it be Europe or Japan or other Asian countries, um, I think having um, you know, support and um, communication and coordination with others will make the US more successful. And here I, I give the example of steel over capacity. It's not an issue that can just be dealt with bilaterally. And I think it needs a multilateral solution, which this administration, even though it hates the word multilateral and the idea of multilateral solutions, has admitted in this case that um, a multilateral approach is needed. And I also would urge the administration to come up with a coherent US-China trade policy and strategy um, soon. And I think this will help um, reduce surprises, make it clearer to China what they need to do, and establish um, a, a clear point of contact for China on these issues. So in conclusion, I believe the outlook for US-China relations is, is of concern, and we should expect increased friction to, between the two countries going forward. That said, this level and magnitude of the friction can be decreased and managed if both countries are serious about engaging and reaching agreements on the longstanding and emerging issues on our trade agenda. And without such an engagement and a sense that we're headed towards concrete outcomes on these um, issues, I fear that we will, will be, um, we're gonna see some tough, tougher times ahead. Thank you very much. Professor uh, Hong from UIBE. Okay, I'm, I'm very glad to be here and thank you for the organizer, Professor Maggie's invitation. Uh, today I have learned a lot. But I will talk about the trade issue between China and the United States. Uh, this is a very complex, very complex topic. Uh, and it's even harder for me because, you know, now it's the midnight in Beijing. So my, my brain is in a <laughs> sleeping mode. <laughs> okay. I will start from the, the trade facts between China and the United States. Uh, we know that uh, China state become the largest part, trade partner 
for each other. Okay. Uh, since 2004, United States become the largest part, trade partner of China. And uh, two years ago, China became the largest partner of the United States. Okay. Uh, so this is a very important uh, relationship between two, for, uh, not only for China, but also for the United States. Another one is from the regional uh, perspective. Yeah. So this is the, the, the data. Uh, from the regional perspective, we know uh, we link these countries with their largest trade partner. Uh, so from this picture, we see that there are three main trade blocks in the world, Asia, uh, North America, and the European Union. In 1995, Japan was the trade center in Asia. And the German is the center of the European Union, and the United States was the center of the uh, North America, of course. Uh, but this one changed. I mean, to 2014, China became the trade center in the in, in Asia, Asian region. Okay. Uh, another interesting factor is that we see the European European market is more independent, but. Uh, North America and the Asian market very closely linked. Uh, the, 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 the main trade platform in Asia is uh, uh, China. Okay. So from this one, I just want to say that the trade relationship between China and the United States not only influence, not only the two countries' problem, but also the regional problem at, uh, at the least. Uh, this morning, I, we, we have the keynote speech by Professor Wei. I, I very enjoy his speech because uh, for doing research, we can uh, study the, the trade influence from some specific angle. But uh, to make policy, we should uh, look into the influence from a broader perspective. Okay. So I briefly uh, introduce the both the employment, consumer, and the environmental influence of the trade between China and the United States. Okay. We know that uh, from this uh, morning's uh, uh, speech, uh, there are uh, a big influence of the Sino-U.S. trade on the employment in the United States. But if we look at into uh, from the supply chain perspective, we know uh, the story may be different, right? Uh, we should not only look at the direct effect, but also indirect effect. Not only the, the, the manufacturing sector, but also the service sector in the United States. Not only the, uh, the, the competition effect, but also the cost push effect. So from that perspective, we, we know that this, uh, this morning, uh, Pro Professor Wei's conclusion is, is uh, quite up, 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 up mystic. Okay. It's uh, positive overall on the employment in the United States. Another one is from the consumer side. Uh, the study by, by Amity and uh, his colleagues find that China trade shock reduced the US manufacturing price index by 7.6%. Uh, it's a very big uh, percentage. Uh, one third of this is due to the variety change, another, uh, another uh, two uh, third is due to the lower price. Okay. This lower price not only because of the low price of the Chinese food, but also due to the competition effect, the price of the competitor firms also reduce. Okay. Uh, another one is from the environmental uh, perspective. Uh, by using the world input output database, we do the analysis to look at the carbon emissions embodied in imports from the United States to China and from China to United States, we find that carbon emission, this one is for the intermediate goods, uh, carbon emissions transfer from China to the US for meeting the US final demand, uh, this is for, for the final goods, through uh, final goods trade is uh, uh, much larger. This one is from the intermediate goods and services. We also find the same trend. So uh, combine all of these facts, 
and findings, we, we, we can say that uh, U.S. consumers enjoy and, and, and the factories enjoy the lower price of the final goods and also intermediate goods, but uh, China take the environmental cost because much of, lots of the, the, the carbon emissions happened in China. Now, the recent uh, very hot topic is IPR issue. You know, previously, nobody knew 301 section in China, but now even the taxi driver know what is a 301 <laughs> section in China. Okay. Uh, th there's a very big debate over this problem, right? Uh, the U.S. initiated an investigation to, into China's theft of IPR issue using the Section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974, uh, which has not been used for uh, quite a long time uh, over uh, against China. We think that uh, WTO TRIPS agreement is a more reasonable and acceptable outcome from the long-term multilateral negotiations. Uh, uh, it has more legit, legitimacy than the Section 301. And even U.S. allies complain about the use of that one. Uh, one problem is that the criteria, criteria in Section 301 is vague. Okay? You, we can, you cannot use the U.S. standard to, to judge the problem in, in, in China, right? And uh, apply U.S. laws to other countries is unreasonable. Uh, we know somebody say there is a national interest based on fair trade, but uh, from our perspective, it's very difficult to define what is fair. Okay? Maybe it's fair for developer from the perspective of developed countries, but unfair to developing countries. Okay? Uh, and also, it's not reasonable to force other countries to adopt the same tariff rates, the same trade policies, and the same IPR laws as the U.S regardless of other countries' history and development status. We look at the history in the United States. For more than 50 years, U.S. had a much higher tariff rates than its European peers. Much higher. We look at this one. So if during that period, European Union forced U.S. to adopt the same tariff rate. Is it, it was reasonable or, or fair to United States? Of course not, right? Uh, we look at the link between different stages of development and uh, different levels of IPR pr protection. You can see normally the more developed countries, they have higher uh, levels of IP protection, but the developing country they normally adopt the lower level of IP protection. This is a very natural phenomenon. Uh, China actually has adopted what we call the independent innovation strategy. We have put lots of efforts in innovation and R&D. Uh, this figure gives the R&D expenditure over time and also the share to GDP. It increased quickly in China. And uh, another, the right one gives the patent, a different index for, for patent and innovations. Or also, all of them increase uh, steadily over the time. And the enterprises are the main contributor to the growth of patent uh, during the last uh, uh, six years. Uh, among them, the small and the medium-sized enterprises play a very important role. Okay. Then the above scale firms in China, uh, but the, uh, of course the high quality patent shows lower growth rate in China. This is a problem. So we we we, we try we put, should put more effort in in developing these high quality patents and innovations. And the, the government has taken lots of preferential policies towards the innovation, including the innovation funds. Uh, increased from uh, 3.77 billion RMB in 2011 to 4.37 billion RMB in the year of 2014. And we also have the R&D ex uh, expenditure tax relief. Right? Also the uh, preferential policy on tax for high-tech firms that have the lower tax. So by this way, we try to promote the innovation in China. 
from another perspective, the government take a lot of measures for IPR protection. Uh, one side, the legal system is continuously improved, including the revision of the trademark laws in China. Okay? We adopt a, a more strict, more serious, punitive compensation system, so on. Okay? And also, we expand the scope of IPR protection. Uh, on the other side, we strengthen the law enforcement in China. We know that the, this one is uh, the enforcement may be more important in China because China is a so big country. Uh, the enforcement of this uh, maybe sometimes is very difficult. Very difficult. Right? Uh, the government uh, have strengthened the 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 the. the uh, the monitor of the infri infringement and uh, counterfeiting activities in internet, in rural areas, and also in import and export stages, and so on. And also, we strengthen in the regional corporations. We take some actions to, to protest uh, uh, IPR issue across regions. And we also deepen the international co cooperation, including between China, US, and the European Union, and so on. Uh, through these measures, we can see that the, the satisfaction level of IPR in China increased over time. Uh, from the 2000 year, this index is uh, uh, 63%. Uh, percent. 2016 increased to 72%. Percent. Okay. Uh, also, some, someone criticized China, uh, uh, the IPR issue, because we require, uh, it, during some, uh, in some industry, we require the foreign investment to establish joint venture with, uh, with the local companies and so on, right? Uh, this, for, by this one to promote the, the technology transfer. But now, one basic fact is that China is more and more open to foreign investment. We can see this one from the the category of the of the industrial guideline uh, for FDI in China. Uh, the latest uh, version is 2017. We can see the number of industries belong, belonging to restriction uh, reduced from the 87, 87 to 33 in 2017. And uh, uh, belong to prohi uh, prohibit category uh, decreased from the from 14 to 28 categories. So more and more open. Another one, we also do a test by adopting the negative list for FDI okay, uh, in Shanghai free trade zone and other free trade zones in China. We can see that the negative list becomes shorter and shorter over time. In 2013, there are uh, 50, there are 190 special administrative measures. Okay, by the Chinese government to the FDI. But to uh, 2017, these administrative measures reduced to 95. Okay, so reduce uh, about half of the, this one. So we are more and more open to foreign investment. So conclusions. Uh, the trade between China and U.S. is very important and complex, but uh, I, my personal view, it is still a win-win situation. From the U.S. perspective, uh, maybe your concern is reduced employment, but uh, if we take a look at it fr from a broader perspective, like a value-added uh, value chain and so on, not necessary, right? And increase real wage overall, lower your uh, goods and service price and, co and the cost, and also reduce pollution in the United States. But also, of course, China also benefit. We create jobs, we, we have more government revenue and tax and so on. Second, China has put much effort in independent innovation and done a lot in protecting IPR, including foreign companies' IP. We have such motivation, not only because there is international pressure, Okay. Uh, but also, we have self, our self uh, motivation because we want to be an innovative country. Okay. So we have to uh, protect, uh, uh, adopt a more strict uh, protection over the IPR. The suggestions, firstly, we should stay collaboration. Uh, we just, just now we say maybe there's a possibility for trade war. I think uh, nobody can take this cost 
this only not, not only influenced China and the United States, but also influenced the regional economy, uh, and even the whole world. Right? So we should stay collaboration. collaboration. Uh, we have different uh, model for globalization from multilateralism to the unilateralism. U unilateralism is dangerous because this may easily lead to the, the trade war. Bilateralism also may be the, the, the next choice, but it also lead to some problems, uh, especially for the Italian noodle effect. Okay? We know that adoption of, of uh, FTA clause is uh, quite low. Uh, because the learning cost is very high, especially for the medium-sized and the small companies. Right? Uh, so the better choice is the regionalism or the multilateralism. Uh, another suggestion is we should continue the Sino-US BIT negotiation. We know that under the Obama uh, administration, we have negotiated for, for, for many rounds and uh, make big progress. Okay? Uh, China also make very big. Uh, 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 we reduce we, we reduce the negative list to to very big degree. Uh, but uh, after Trump step up, this one stopped. So my suggestion is we should continue this negotiation. If U.S. has some concern over China, like IPR issue, we can negotiate this one under the BIT. Negotiation. I think this is a more formal one. Uh, Sino-US BRT negotiation not only important for China and the United States, but also for the world. We know that there, there is a multilateral uh, one for trade, right? WTO, but there is not such one for investment. Uh, during some period, the developed country, they, they initiated the, the multilateral investment treaty negotiation, but uh, rejected by the developing countries because during that period, uh, the developing country are mainly the recipient of FDI. Okay. But now the situation changed because for many developing countries, we are not only the, the re recipient of FDI, but also lots of outward FDI from these developing countries. So we can find more balanced interest I mean, uh, inflow and outflow. So I think uh, we can prepare the negotiation for the multilateral uh, investment treaty. Maybe we can, uh, we, we can adopt uh, the more, more like uh, TISA in a power, uh, power lateral, uh, lateral uh, mode. Okay? If we, have, we, we can organize, we can invite some countries with the common interest uh, to start a negotiation firstly, then promote this one to other countries. Uh, lastly, I think uh, it's another important one is to think about the, the trade integration in Asia Pacific region. We know that now the, uh, uh, the Trump uh, government, they, they prefer the bilateral trade negotiation, right? But that one lead to some problems as I mentioned, especially the Italian noodle effect, right? uh, increase the learning cost. We can think about the FTAAP in Asia Pacific region. This one can cover TPP. Of course, now U.S. dropped, but uh, the rest uh, economies still continue to, to, to negotiate. We uh, can also cover the ASEP, okay, ASEAN plus plus, right, and also NAFTA. So if we can uh, make make progress over FTAP, I think this is a very good uh, outcome, uh, given that the economic relationship between Asia and North America is very close, as I, as I uh, mentioned in the early. Okay. Uh, so this is my presentation. Thank you very much. All right. Um, happy to introduce Maggie to come on up. Well, first of all, thank you all for staying, coming and staying. And I want to thank my fellow panelists for the very insightful presentations. In my short talk, I will probably just take a step backward and focus on some of the basic myths and the reality of US-China trade. So what, the, what is the issue? 
So this picture shows you the trade deficit between the United States and China between 1985 and now. And you can see that number has gone from virtually zero to now about $350 billion, right? And that increase in trade deficit accelerated after China joined WTO. And this is a world view, right? So you can see who else the US is running a trade deficit. And obviously, China is leading the race, right? In fact, as the China trade deficit is about five times, right, the size of the US Germany deficit, the US Japan, and, you know, and the US Canada Mexico combined, basically. So, so this seems to be the biggest issue here. And then this picture, right, shows you the correlation between US manufacturing employment as a share of total employment, that is the blue curve, the declining one, and then the brown one is the um, imports from China as a percentage of GDP, right? So clearly, we saw a surge of imports from China during this period, and the decline, a sharp decline in US manufacturing employment. In fact, I did experiment uh, in one of my classes I showed my students, actually I randomized, I put my students in random groups. For one of them, I showed this figure, right? We did a survey, asked them about, you know, their demographic information and, you know, their political views and, and show them this information and U.S. income inequality and then asked them about their preferences for economic policy, trade policy, or globalization. And then the control group is the one that did not receive this information, rather receiving some information about how technology might be the leading cause of these things, um, manufacturing employment decline. So guess what? The first group that received this figure expressed their views against globalization much more strongly, right? Despite that, the professor is a Chinese, right, from China, who will grade their finals. They still told me, right, one after another, that if any country they want to raise tariffs, that would be China, right? So information clearly mattered here. However, this picture is not I mean, it's not telling us everything, right? So there are a lot of things missing. And that one of the things is what, you know, Shangjing mentioned this morning, this is manufacturing employment, so that's one thing. And the second thing is, uh, we are looking at imports from China, we're singling out imports from China, but do we see something similar when we look at imports from other countries. I mean, imports from China are growing because you know, China joined WTO. And third is, is trade the only cause here, right? Tr could trade be a scapegoat for something else, like the skill bias technology progress we have seen in the same period of time? So there are a few myths, I think, they're at the center of the problem, right? The first myth is aggregate versus bilateral trade deficit. Right? U.S. runs an aggregate trade deficit. Why? Because the country spends more than it earns. It's that simple, right? Your trade balance is going to be equal to your, you know, your income minus your consumption. So in 2015, the U.S. household firm government earned about $17 trillion, $16.9 trillion, and spent $17.4 trillion on goods and services. So that results in a deficit of $500 billion, right? And then when a country runs an aggregate trade you know, imbalance, right, that imbalance must fall on certain countries and cause significant bilateral trade deficits. These bilateral trade deficits, however, are a symptom rather than a cause, the cause of the imbalance. Okay? Another view to show this is, if you look at this one, the blue curve is the US-Japan deficit. Okay? And the red curve is the US-China trade deficit. So what you see here is, as the US-Japan deficit started to shrink, the US-China deficit started to expand. Right? And the yellow curve is the two countries' deficit altogether combined. Right? So as, some country, as, as the U.S. trades less with some country, the U.S. trade with some other country will rise. The deficit will rise. Now, the second myth is what causes trade deficit. As I mentioned already, aggregate trade deficit is a macroeconomic problem. When you spend more than you earn, you have aggregate trade deficit. 
And that deficit rises when savings fall and when investment rises. Bilateral trade deficit, however, is more a structural problem, right? It's a, re- it's a result of countries' differences in comparative advantages, productivity, demand for goods, right? And now, in the last couple of decades, the global value chains. I actually want to use an analogy I heard from my colleague, Jay Shambo. So if we think of ourselves as a country, right? Our you know, bank account will tell us our aggregate trade balance, right? It could be positive, it could be negative, right? And that number depends on how much we spend every day on food, on shopping, and how much we earn. But then, when I think about myself, I run almost a trade deficit with everybody in my life, except my students, right? My hairdresser, my dry cleaner, the, the restaurants I go to, I run a trade deficit with all of them because I only spend and I don't earn any money from them, right? The only people I run you know, a trade surplus with is my students, right? So should I worry so much about bilateral trade deficits I have with almost everybody in my life, you know? and try to reduce these bilateral trade deficits by cutting my own hair, right? So stop going to my hairdresser, you know, because I'm spending so much money and a huge trade deficit by cutting my own hair or have, for example, my students cut my hair. I would never do that, (laughs) right? I mean, not that I don't love my students, many of them are in the room, but it's just not the way it is. Bilateral trade balances are determined by your comparative advantages and specialization, right? So rather, we should focus on aggregate trade deficit aggregate trade balance, right? How my bank account is telling me, but not how I'm doing, you know, interacting with people in my life. So what's the role of value chain, right? So it turns out Apple is actually playing a big role, right? In this US-China trade deficit. Why is that? So if you look at this iPhone example, right? So China, as we all know, is the last stop basically, of the iPhone Apple production, right, where the assembly takes place. So China imports the components, right, to produce the iPhone from all over the world, including the United States. U.S. exports about $25 of components to China, and Korea, Germany, France, Japan, and many other countries export components to China for final assembly, right? Foxconn, in fact, the Taiwanese multinational company, is responsible for the assembly. And then China exports the finished goods to the rest of the world, including the United States. Well, if you look at the official statistics, by definition, the China-U.S. trade balance is going to be negative here. It's going to be a deficit for the United States. Why? Because China imports the components, right? And then exports the finished good. The finished good is going to be priced at a higher level value than the component. So for every single iPhone right, being transacted between the two countries, our trade deficit is going to expand, right? But if you look at the value added of that iPhone in China, it's only about $6, right? $6. So the right way to look at things should not be based on the value of the, the goods or components crossing the borders, but the value added of the tasks being traded between the countries, right? So... In fact, if you look at this, this is the famous smiley curve, right? I don't know, probably many of you have seen this before. So the vertical axis is the value added, right, in a particular country, right? And, and you know, it could be the electronics industry, it could be some other industry, semiconductor industries. And the horizontal axis is the production process, the stages of the production process, from the product design, R&D, uh, you know, material and all the way going through the assembly, marketing, and customer services, right? So the upstream to downstream. What you see is there is a U-shaped relationship between value added and where you are in the production chain, right? The very upstream countries that tend to be occupying the upstream positions, like the R&D, right? Or the countries that are occupying the very downstream positions, like marketing and customer services, right? And the U.S. happens to be in both, right? Upstream and downstream. Tend to earn higher value added. You know, you enjoy a higher profit margin. Countries, and many developing countries, emerging economies, tend to occupy the middle positions, the assembly, right? And there you have the lowest value added in the production, okay? So these countries naturally will run a trade surplus with the countries at upstream and downstream 
down, especially downstream countries, because just of the way they are located in the production chain. Right? This is not even taking into account comparative. Right? This is just the way countries are specializing in this process of production. Now, if we abandon the official statistics in when we calculate trade balances and instead use value added, right? Looking at the value added embodied in the tasks that are being traded between countries, what's going to happen to our trade deficit? Well, not surprisingly, that number is going to shrink, right? The blue curve is a trade deficit in terms of the, 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 the official statistics, the, way, the statistics we typically see and hear from the press. The red curve, right, or the blue one, the dash one, represents the U.S. trade deficit calculated based on value added, right? And you can see that number that shrinks substantially. Okay, so I think how we measure trade balance is very important for our understanding. Now, the third means is should we be concerned with trade deficit? Yes, at the aggregate level, right? Why? Well it can be associated with job losses, right? And even there is debatable, right? We know trade has been at the forefront when we think about who has allowed to, who has you know, caused uh, the manufacturing job loss. We always think about trade, but it could be the technology. A recent research by Darren Asimoglu, for example, showed that you know, automation, robots, these could lead to very similar out outcomes just like the, you know, what we have been focusing on with trade. It could lead to rising income inequality, right? It could lead to instability and unsustainability when we have high national debts, and we have all kinds of other consequences when we have a lack of government investment. Now, the next one is what should be done, right? So there's a street view on this, and that is let's raise trade barriers, let's exit trade agreements, right? That seems to be the most natural way if you want to fight trade deficit, right? You, then you reduce imports. And how do we reduce imports? We raise trade barriers. We quit the trade um, uh, re agreements. Would that work? Well, it turns out, actually, you know, I love what Shangjing showed this morning, right? There is a negative correlation between unemployment and trade deficit. Trade deficits tend to be high when the unemployment rate is low. Right? That's a correlation. Guess what? There's also a neg another correlation, a negative correlation between trade deficit and tariff rate. Sorry, negative between trade balance and the trade barriers. So countries with low trade barriers actually tend to run trade surplus, tend to have a more positive trade balance, whereas countries with high trade barriers, actually, based on this simple correlation, tend to have a trade deficit. So why is that? Well, when you raise your trade barriers, right, you import less, right, and the exchange rate will respond to that in a way that makes your currency more valuable, and that would hurt your exports, right? So trade barriers will not only affect your imports, but it would also affect your exports, making the final result, that effect, kind of ambiguous. What about walking away from trade agreements? Well, I was working on TPP for nine months last year, right, until right before the election, right? And, and then my, my job was over, right? And the work never saw the light. Um, I think I never saw the light. It's still sitting somewhere in my computer. Um, so I, we were, I was working at the, at the Congressional Budget Office. So the minute we walked away, when I say we, actually, it's confusing. OK, I, went, I meant the US. OK, so I use we in different contexts. Sometimes it's US, sometimes it's China. So when the US walked away from the trade agreement, that minute, right, it handed China a great opportunity to take leadership in trade integration, in trade agreements. You know, so. I'm not sure that's going to ad address our trade deficit either. It might help, you know, it might reduce, I mean, raise trade barriers against China might reduce U.S.-China trade deficit, but I'm not sure it's going to help our aggregate trade deficit. So what could be done then, right? So I would argue that the focus should not be on trade policy, especially not tra bilateral trade policy, but rather macroeconomic policy to raise savings, to encourage innovation, to invest in infrastructure, and here, the next couple of points actually are all about mobility. 
which includes geographic mobility, right? I think this country, I actually believe I'm coming from, you know, every time I go to China, right, and I come back, I'm more convinced that we need more better infrastructure just to improve the geographic mobility, right, between, you know, between firms and the markets, between individuals, between individuals and jobs, right, to help people get to their opportunities more easily, right? And I think Ning would agree, especially he just drove from New York. <laughs> and uh, to invest in education, right? So this is to enhance social and labor mobility, right? How can we help workers transition from one occupation, from the, you know, the challenged, well, challenged occupation to a more promising occupation to switch sectors, and that's incredibly important. And the redistribution consequences of globalization should also be addressed with better tax policies, with better trade assistance to those who have been put in a disadvantaged positions due to globalization. The last question, will the US-China trade tension go away? And I think I will agree with everybody here, the two panelists, it won't go away. The short answer is no. Why? Well, the nature of the competition or the tension might change, right? It used to be textile, it used to be assembly, but maybe not by 2025. As the U.S. was introducing, emphasizing made in America, China's Chinese government is also pushing now China, made in China, right? The China 2025. The competition might not be happening in steel or textile much longer. The competition can be happening in the driverless cars, right? The semiconductors industries, the solar panels, right? The medical devices, right? And the artificial intelligence. So the nature of competition, the field of competition is changing. It doesn't mean the competition is gonna go away. In fact, it can intensify. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, we've got uh, quite a bit of time for questions, and um, I think I'm going to take my moderator uh, privilege and uh, ask the first question once they get situated here. All right, microphone's on. So the one question I have for all of you, I think, is um, to, to maybe uh, talk a little bit about how you see the resilience of international institutions, especially the WTO. Uh, because all of you have talked a little bit about um, dangers in the future coming from um, perhaps um, sort of stepping away from the WTO. Uh, the U.S. has been using instruments, um, procedures, or rules that um, kind of date back in history and could instigate um, unilateral actions. Um, you know, Wendy, you talked about how that might then potentially lead to a, a trade war. And it might lead to countries sort of backing off from their WTO commitments. If the U.S. stops following them, will China follow in suit? And then what's your sense, any of you, about the sort of the attitudes in the rest of the world about WTO? Are, is there still a strong commitment to that? Or do you feel that um, sort of the, this worry about globalization um, is starting to cause attitudes to slip a little bit and, um, and move away from um, a feeling of uh, positive attitudes towards globalization? Uh, Wendy, maybe you can start. Um, well, thank you. That's a big question. <laughs> maybe it'll be subject of another panel. Um, you know, when I started my career at USTR, it was in that time the GATT office, which turned into the WTO office. And that was by far the biggest office at USTR because that's where all the trade action was happening. Um, we had successful negotiating rounds. A lot of countries were acceding to the WTO. And it seemed like the best place to um, achieve trade liberalization that would you know, affect everyone and you get the biggest bang for your buck. But over time, I think what we've seen is a few things. Number one, the WTO as a negotiating forum, its ability to negotiate trade agreements has diminished over time. Why is that? I would argue because there are a lot more countries in the WTO and particularly um, emerging countries um, that um, you know are not prepared to make the same level of concessions, or they're not they're not prepared to make the level of succession concessions 
that the developed countries are expecting them to make. And so we saw the Doha development round launched in 2001. Um, it went on for about you know, 12 years, nothing happened. Um, I, you know, I'm in meetings now where some people you know, contend that it's still alive and they're still trying to bring it to closure. I think from the US perspective, it's pretty much dead. And so as a result of, um, of the failure of the Doha round, countries, including the United States under the Obama administration, then tried to negotiate what we call plurilateral agreements. Let's try and do agreements kind of at the critical mass of countries. So the Information Technology Agreement, which was concluded a few years ago in the WTO, did show that you know, there's, there's an ability to at least achieve some type of trade agreements in the WTO. But overall, I would argue that the failure of the WTO to really deliver its ability to comprehensively to deliver comprehensive trade negotiations has led trading partners to, to turn to regional and bilateral agreements. Second, the second big function of the WTO major function has been its dispute settlement function. Um, and with the, with the creation of the WTO in 1995, this procedure was tightened considerably um, under which uh, one, co one country could no longer block dispute settlement decisions. So in effect, they were binding. And over time, I believe that this function of the WTO has worked reasonably well. There have been issues. Um, but I would say with the current administration, particularly um, the USTR um, Ambassador Lighthizer, he has very different views. And I think his views are based on his career as a steel lawyer in the private sector, where he believes that the WTO dispute settlement is, is broken and it needs to be fixed. And right now, there are some really contentious talks in the WTO about the future and the fate of the WTO dispute settlement mechanism. And then third, the WTO has served as a useful body for countries to get together and do in these various committees and do committee work, whether it be in government procurement or standards or import licensing or agriculture, where countries get together, they notify measures, they talk, they put peer pressure on each other, and you know, that process is continuing. So I think you know, that's kind of a snapshot of the WTO. I think it still provides a useful function but I have a hard time seeing it, seeing it really revive and become the locus for negotiating activity. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think uh, WTO still be good and important. Uh, it, it's a multilateral trade agreement. More than 100 <coughs> countries doing trade under the framework of WTO. So still very important, but uh, needs some reform, I think. Uh, firstly, I, sh I think we should make the decision-making uh, process be more effective. Okay? We know that there, there, there has been no progress for a long time. Okay? We, we need to do something uh, to make it more effective. Second, I think we, we can include, consider to include more new topics, new generation trade topics uh, under WTO, like uh, e-commerce and, uh, and uh, labor and the environmental and something like that. Okay. Uh, how, to, how to achieve this? Uh, I think uh, we can consider to integrate WTO with something like the regional reason and uh, pol polylateralism. Okay. Uh, like something negotiated first day in t under TISA and the TPP, uh, then after done, we can promote it uh, to make it a uh, multilateral, and then to finally to WTO. So by this way, to include more and more new topics, new generation rule uh, into WTO. So we uh, need reform the system. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I was just uh, echo basically um, the messages here. WTO, I think. Um, the trade dispute mechanism might probably is one of the better functioning um, but better functions of the WTO, I think, has been quite effective in the past. And U.S. set a lot of rules in WTO, as we know, and U.S. has used WTO rules very aggressively. And even though there are some imperfections, you know, that there are inefficiencies, there is a backlog of cases, and now we have vacancies, I think, at the 
the judicial board. I think there are three judge positions being vacated right now. Uh, so we need to fill those positions. So there are a lot of issues in the WTO, but I think we still need that framework. A lot of companies now you know, have to go to the regional trade agreement uh, dispute settlement uh, mechanism if they want to get the issues resolved more quickly. But we still need those frameworks for our companies you know, to, to deal with the trade disputes they run into. OK. Floor is open. Let's go right here. Take a couple of questions. Oh, hi. Uh, given the, uh, well, this is a question to Maggie and uh, Wendy mainly. Uh, given the current uh, political uh, environment, I mean the White House, uh, what can you do or take the advantage of it in making Elena Zhao do more to uh, improve the infra infrastructure in the U.S.? That's what I'm wondering. You, you mentioned that each time you came back from China, you think that U.S. infrastructure need a, a you know, thing. So how can we make this administration do its bit to improve that? Wendy, you want to answer first? Yeah, I'll let you. <laughs> Go ahead. We'll Go ahead, Maggie. I, oh, I have well, a couple yeah. questions. OK, all right. Well, I'm not sure we can make the current administration do anything <laughs> differently than they are doing. Um, but I think you know a broader answer would be you know when you want to invest more in infrastructure, whether it's the you know the physical infrastructure or some other soft infrastructure, you just need to save more. The government needs to, you know have higher saving rate. The country, and you need to spend less in some other areas. So I'll just leave it there. You know, and you can think about what the other areas that you need to cut your spending. Right. So. Another question here, and I'll get you next. Uh, one argument we, we often hear from the Chinese side about the trading balance is that the uh, U.S. is restricting the high-tech products exporting to China. So I wonder if there's a, a research to see how significant a fact is that uh, can, you know, to, to the overall imbalance between the two countries. Okay, we'll do one more question here in the back there. Hello, this is a question for Mrs. Chen. I, I was wondering if the uh, US trade deficit and other trade deficits are a result uh, partly of the simple supply chain process, should we be worried about trade deficits or trade surpluses if, um, if they are derived from the simple way that the supply chain works, thus that some countries will simply turn out to be have trade deficits um, for prolonged periods of times, and other countries will have trade surpluses for a prolonged period of time. And perhaps that's just simply economic law due to the way the geographical structure of the world is set up, and what countries have what comparative advantage and what processes in the supply chain. Okay, let's. So I think your question was, was how significant are, are U.S. restrictions on imports of Chinese high-tech? Oh, to, to China. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are, you know, there's a series of barriers that are preventing uh, the United States companies in the high-tech or what I would call the ICT sector. So I don't, I'm not just talking about equipment, but I'm talking about software and other, you know, um, ICT um, exports to China, and you know, there's a range of them. There are import restrictions, uh, excuse me, there are investment restrictions where companies need to form joint ventures. There are restrictions where companies need to turn over their source code to their Chinese joint venture partner, or they need to share their IPR with their Chinese joint venture partner. Those become restrictions. There are restrictions on you know, you recently Apple's apps, you know, certain um, apps were restricted and one can argue that that's, you know, import, it, their products get into the country, but then their application, their usage is limited. Um, and then I think, you know, Maggie had mentioned, I'd mentioned briefly too, this Made in China 2025 program where China has targeted 10 sectors um, where they are going to basically nurture national champions with the objective of becoming global leaders um, in these sectors, which, you know, on its face, 
you know, they have the right to do that. It's their country. They have the money. But it's very hard to compete against um, companies that are receiving a lot of funds from their governments for development, et cetera. So I think particularly in this ICT sector, we're going to see more and more trade friction. And I think um, what some of our high tech companies are seeing, that they were invited into China to invest. But the tide is turning now as their competitors and domestic companies are now emerging. They're being kind of kicked out, or they're not as competitive, or they're, they're um, facing more and more restrictions in the market. So I think it's significant, and I think we're going to see more tension, unfortunately, in that area. And Maggie? OK. Um, so to answer the question about trade deficit, as I was argue, arguing earlier that I think aggregate trade deficit can be a cause of concern, but I would argue we should not worry about bilateral trade deficit. I mean, we, Australia actually runs a huge deficit with us, right? We never hear Australia complain um, about the U.S.-Australia trade imbalance. Um, rather, I think the question is, um, the U.S. is extremely concerned about trade deficit because we'll worry about manufacturing jobs. We'll worry about you know, the income inequality. We want those jobs back. But on the other hand, the developing countries are not so happy either, right? So when you think about you know, the current trends, it's kind of puzzling, right? You see developed countries going backward or more inward, right? Because of those concerns of in manufacturing employment. And developing countries, that's developed, developing countries like China, who has been viewed as a big beneficiary of globalization, is also looking inward. You know, in some in some in some ways, because you know they don't want to be stuck in the middle of the smiley curve either. They want to upgrade the economy to be more sophisticated. They want to have more, better, higher quality manufacturing jobs. They don't want to just be the assembly workers. So I think those are the questions the governments, the policymakers are asking. It should not be just what do we do with the bilateral numbers in front of us. Question over here. Hello. Uh, this is a question more for Ms. Cutler. So I, um, I guess during your time with the USTR, I uh, believe you've dealt a lot with like the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, um, and like I guess like the issues I guess they pose for you in terms of um, in terms of your duties as well. And uh, I think over the last 27 years, there's been four uh, presidential blocks of like uh, of different uh, foreign investment in U.S. companies. But two of those blocks have actually occurred in the last 12 months. Uh, so what kind of role do you see of uh, CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US, uh, changing over the Trump administration? And what kind of retaliation would, could we expect from China? And could they be undoing like, the foreign investment uh, regulation loosening that you mentioned earlier? Yeah. Other questions? Go here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's hard to take economics, of course, and economic relations in isolation. They're usually within an international complex setting, including defense strategy issues, et cetera. What effect do you think the ongoing issues about the South China Sea situation and China's reaction specifically, I'm thinking, two international forum decisions in that regard, like the Hague decision, where China seemed to simply refuse to acknowledge the decision, undermines efforts, collaborative international efforts like the WTO as just sort of a general climate, you know, political climate. Uh, one more question here. OK, I have uh, two questions. One, one question for Wendy. For Wendy. Yeah, and uh, you know, President Donald Trump put North Korea nuclear issue with trade relations with China. What do you think of it? And another question for uh, Professor Hong and, uh, and Maggie Chen. Yeah, and uh, if the United States implement 301 Act, what should China take? What measures should China take to against it? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Who wants to start? Um, well, let me start. Um, let me try and answer a couple of those questions. 
With respect to CFIUS, and that's the, and I'm, now I'm going to show my ignorance. I don't know exactly what all those letters stand for. The Committee in Foreign Investment in the U.S., I guess. Right. And hopefully that's a good <laughs> guess. Um, you mentioned that only four cases have been, you know, turned down under, this is the interagency group that looks at um, proposed investment in the United States, and they only look at a very small handful of cases, and um, they look at, look at them from a national security lens. Um, and you mentioned that two were rejected in the past year. I'm not sure of those numbers. But even assuming they're right, I would just point out there that many companies prefer not to go through the whole process, that when they hear and they, you know, they, they, they're, they're, the sense is that this investment's going to be rejected or they're asked to produce mitigation plans, they decide just to withdraw on their own. So I think those actual numbers of formal rejections may be a bit misleading. But that said, um, there's no, you know, there's no secret that there, there is concern about the lack of reciprocity of investment opportunities in the U.S. and in China. You know, we mentioned that in, earlier that in many sectors, China still requires, for example, that you have a joint venture partner before you can invest, while the U.S., we don't have those types of restrictions. And so a number of senators are putting, you know, put forward a bill to improve and expand CFIUS. And I think that's combined with other calls on, on, in, in Congress to restrict Chinese investment here. Um, and I think um, this administration has also raised the whole issue of reciprocity more generally, that that is kind of one of the themes of their tra trade policy, that if a country is pursuing a certain policy and keeping our imports or keeping our investment out, we should be doing something similar. Um, so I do, I do see that the whole area of foreign direct investment may become fertile ground for more restrictions in the U.S. Um, maybe not, you know, not with the word China in them, but you know, targeted at China. And I would say here, since the WTO really doesn't have rules here, it's kind of easier to take measures against um, foreign direct investment and not violate your WTO obligations than it is, for example, to raise tariffs. Um, with respect to the last question, you know, what did I think of the president's remarks where he somehow linked China's um, cooperation on North Korea's sanctions with um, trade? Um, I think um, a lot of people were surprised by those comments. Um, as a policymaker, I will say that I've, you know, through my careers and, you know, many meetings where whenever you're, you're dealing with a country, you're always aware of what's going on in the foreign policy realm. And sometimes you may delay taking actions, you may adjust your actions depending on what's going on in the foreign policy world, but you generally do that privately. And so to like tweet it out and to say, we may do, you know, we may be easier on China if they cooperate in North Korea. I think sends a very um, confusing message. For example, you know, w you know, and, and you know, if China felt like we were, China felt it was cooperating on North Korea sanctions, and then the president says, "Well, in return, I didn't call you a currency manipulator. We're even." Was you know, is that how China interpreted that statement? Who knows? Um, also, if you're Japan or South Korea and you're hearing this statement and you're thinking, well, wait a second, we're really cooperating in North Korea's sanctions and yet we're being hurt on the trade front with the Trump administration. This isn't fair. So I think it was a very confusing statement and I'm glad we haven't heard more of um, that, that train of thought um, lately, but who knows, we may hear it Sunday morning when we wake up. Junjie? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so in terms of the, the 301 section problem, eh? uh, firstly, I, I don't want to, to, to that happen. Right? It's a very serious problem. I believe both sides have enough knowledge to, to resolve the problem in a, in a smarter way. Uh, but if we happen, we, we look at the history. Uh, before China entered WTO, uh, United States, I mean, uh, do the inv did the investigation for several times. Every time they, you give a, a long list of the punishment. Uh, but as a response, China also give a long list of the pu punishment. So, but finally, we resolve the problem uh, through negotiation. So that, that one have never been 
uh, taken place in the, in the history. So now I think we also have the enough knowledge to resolve this one. Yeah. As I mentioned, the trade war between China and the United States not only hurt China and the American economy, but also the world economy. So this is not, a, not a, the issue between two countries, but uh, influence a bigger, uh, more and more countries now. Yeah, thank you. Maggie, a few comments? Yeah, I just want to add one thing. You know, I agree trade and many other aspects of our society, including national security, are closely related, right? I think it's a two-way relationship, you know. But when we combine these things together, we need to be careful not to be more too focused on tra each transaction, right? We should not be taking the approach of transactionism, right? We should have a long-run framework or strategy in mind to make sure this can be, you know, we can use trade to effectively address some of our national security issues and vice versa. So I think we need to have, we here mean the US, I guess, um, in, you know, in conjunction with China, we need to have this long run forward looking view rather than focusing on each problem that lands on our desk. Yeah. All right, well thank you. Let's bring the session to a close and let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much.